We're just back from America. We had a really wonderful time. Uh, I was just so blessed by the, the kindness, the generosity of the people there in the States. It really is an amazing country. I don't think there's anywhere like it on earth. And um, I was really so honored and privileged to be able to preach in the United States, um, particularly considering the blessing the States has been to so many people, so many, so many of us. And um, particularly to stand in Pastor Paul and, and Karen's pulpit in Millennial Church in Tulsa, Tulsa, Jerusalem. And uh, so it was a really wonderful experience. So glory to God. And we're really excited about having them um, uh, next month. Amen. So I just ask you today to open your hearts. I believe the Spirit of God is going to speak to you today. I believe you're going to be blessed by this message. So Father, we just pray today that you would bring forth this message in a manner that will glorify you. And I pray that it would pierce the hearts of people, Lord, and that they would see things they've never seen before, understand things they've never understood before, and that, Lord, that none of us would walk away unchanged. Don't let us walk out of here today, Lord, the way we walk in. Help us to be changed in Jesus' name. The title of the message today is Look and Live. And today, we're going to be taking a fresh look at some old truths, which I believe will hopefully give us some answers to some present problems. I want to start by reading Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So here God says that they have forsaken him as the fountain or the source of living water, and that they have dug themselves wells, cisterns, broken wells that can hold no water. And to be honest, there are things in the church today that are broken. And I'm talking about the church in, in a broad sense. Because sadly, in many instances, we're actually unaware of the fact that things are broken. And, and, and again, so as a consequence of that, we grow accustomed to things as they are. And yet we forget that they're not the way that things were meant to be. And, and, and because of this, we, we learn to cope uh, as opposed to uh, conquering, amen? Uh, many people have come to the place where they, 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 they learn to cope rather than to conquer. And, and that is not the way God wants us to be. He said, you're more than conquerors through Christ who gives you strength, amen? How many of you believe today that you're more than a conqueror, amen? Because that's what God says about you. I'm not saying that that's what your circumstances, your present circumstances may say about you, but that's what God says about you. He says you're more than a conqueror. And as a consequence of this wrong uh, perspective, uh, we learn to survive, we, we learn to get by. Um, where our faith is, is just a theory with no evidence to back it up. No miracles, no change, no far. Um, you know, and, and, and on top of that then, I believe we have developed and brought in some, some very pathetic uh, substitutes for God. You know, we, we settle for mere imitations of God's power. We, we dig our own cisterns, just like we see here in the book of Jeremiah, that can hold no water. You know, we cling to ways of doing things that, that, that are no longer effective simply because they're familiar. And this is the problem. Many times we want familiarity rather than the power of God. So we cling to, this is how traditions are born, because we refuse to move on with God. And um, so again, this, this inability to move with change, I believe, is a problem because as a consequence of this, our, 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 our pulpits give lectures with no life. Um, you know, we, we hold to principles that, that have no power. You know, we have services with lots of life, but very little heat, no fire, no demonstration. The book of Timothy talked about this, about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You see, this faith is not meant to be simply a theoretical faith, something that you ascribe to mentally. It is meant to be something that you experience in your personal life. There should be some evidence to back up your faith, okay? And as Elijah amply demonstrated to the world, a faith without power is ultimately a faith without proof. And I want us to turn there, 1 Kings chapter 18. The people of God had fallen away from God. Elijah comes and he confronts the, the spirit. And um, he says, therefore, let them give them two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. 
but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is, um, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves, prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God and put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until evening, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made, and it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry out for he is God. Either he is meditating or he's busy or on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the evening offering, sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And so all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. As the church, we need to break, we need to repair some altars that have been broken down. You know, in this nation, the sanctity of marriage, the, the sanctity of life. We see this week in, in the US, the Democrats voted down, uh, you know, a bill that would have provided protection for children that were born as a result of botched abortions. And I think that's a tragedy. It's a, a tragic indictment of where our society is at where not only do we want to deny the right to life of the unborn, even we want to deny the right to those who are born. And this is the problem with a spirit. A spirit is never satisfied. That spirit of bloodlust will never be satisfied. And it's an antichrist spirit. It was, we see it at the time of Moses, just when the people of God were about to be delivered, you know, the Pharaoh killed all the male children. We see it at the time of Christ, the same spirit, all of the male children being killed. And we're seeing that same spirit again. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus is coming back. This is why we must pray for our leaders. Because it's an antichrist spirit that wants to get a grip on, on the nations. But anyway, it says there was no voice. Elijah called the people to them. He repaired the altar. Then the stones, he took 12 stones uh, for the tribes of Israel. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wool and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And they said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and they also filled the trench with water. Do you know it hadn't rained on the earth for three and a half years? And the most precious commodity at that time was water. And here he calls them to pour out that water. Let me tell you, there's not going to be revival until we get to a place where we're willing to sacrifice some things. Sacrifice financially. Sacrifice our reputation. Sacrifice whatever because we want to see God moving in our generation. Amen. It says they poured it out. And it says the water was, was, was lying around there on, on the altar. So the water filled the trench. And it came to pass at the time of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it known be to you this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and I've done these things at your word. When I look at the church and I see the foolishness the foolishness that's, that's pervading so much of the church. We think that they'll come because we, we play rock music or because we have lights or because we've got good coffee or because we dress contemporary. That is all just superficial nonsense. We must come to a place where we call our generation back to repentance. But we cannot call the world to repentance until we come to a place of repentance ourselves. They will not fear God if we do not fear Him. Right. And Elijah called his generation back to God. And I believe that cry is going forth in the spirit today to the church. There is a separation between those who are playing church and those who will be the church. Hear me, O oh Lord. Hear me that the people may know that you are the Lord God and that, they, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. 
Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. This is what we want to see. We want to see the hearts of our generation turn back to Him. And I believe this message, I believe, contains a, a, a secret towards that, that change. Because again, the change starts here. It starts in our hearts. Elijah called the people back to God. He said, the God who answers by fire, he is God. You know, how many times do we avoid putting ourselves into situations like Elijah, where if God doesn't come true, we are left looking ridiculous. He said, the God who answers by far. He didn't have a scheme or an agenda or, or, you know, he didn't try and manipulate circumstances. It was going to be quite evident if God didn't come true for him. And yet, so many times we look for a plan B just in case God is not enough. You know what? We're more conscious of, of, of our reputation. We're more conscious of what people think about us. But this is why the fire of God fell. Elijah put himself in a position where he needed the fire of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. We have to come to a place where we see the power of God in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our nations. You know, sadly, the empty schemes and agendas and wisdom of men have left the church in a place where we have religion rather than revival. Where we have formulas but no freedom. Where we have ego-affirming messages but no life-transforming encounters. Father, I just pray that you would shake us through this message today in Jesus' name. You may never come back to this church again, but you know what? Today you're going to hear from God. The Spirit of God continues to move forward relentlessly, even if we insist on clinging to the dead and lifeless patterns of the past, and we will be left behind. The tragedy is this. In many instances, God, the Spirit of God, has taken His hands off of something, and the church doesn't even notice. You know, where God is no longer in the room, and we can't even tell the difference. You know, Judges chapter 16 and verse 20 says the Spirit of God had departed from, um, the Spirit of God had departed from, from Samson and he didn't even recognize it. And I sometimes wonder, does this describe the church? Can we have church and, and have a good time and jump and sing and do all this stuff and the Spirit of God isn't even there? Hallelujah. I don't want to be in that place where I can't even discern whether God is there or not. Whether His presence is there or not. And this is the problem. We've come to the place in the church where we, we know how to manipulate things. You know how to manipulate people's emotions. I mean, give, give people a buzz. and It's not about that. It's not about trying to imitate the world or trying to look like a nightclub or sound like a nightclub or try and give people some sort of a church experience. It's about coming and encountering the living God. Because when you encounter God, you can never be the same again. How many of you are here today because you want to meet with God? Samson didn't realize the presence of God had left his life. And is this where the church now finds itself? All shout but no clout. You know, even Gideon had the honesty to ask, if God is with us, then where are all the miracles? He said, if God is with us, where are the miracles? Why are so many people in the body of Christ today sick, depressed, afraid, defeated, backslidden, lukewarm? You know, why aren't we seeing a greater impact and influence on our society? I mean, is this how it ends? No. No, it's not. 
So what is the answer to our predicament? I believe that Christ revealed the answer to the times that we are living in. We must look and live. John chapter 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Numbers chapter 21, and the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered them, delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. And you know, great discouragement can follow great victory. This is why you have to guard your heart. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Remember something. You may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're on the way. You may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. How many of you know there was a time at this time of the morning, you might be waking up with a headache after being out all night drinking. You're not where you used to be, so thank God for that. You know, you're making progress. You're on the way. And it says they became discouraged on the way, and the people spoke against uh, God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, no water, and our soul loads this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the children of Israel died. Therefore, the, the people said to Moses, we have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Moses had a pastor's heart. He loved the people. And it says, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. Here we see the principle of look and live. And the, the, the irony is the, a snake that was biting them, God says, make a symbol of that snake, put, put it on a pole, and when they look at it, they will live. This really didn't make sense. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and it was as if the serpent had bitten anyone. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So this is the beautiful thing. You know, in the face of demonic attack and the unavoidable trials and tribulations and traumas of life, the pattern is and always has been look and live. And the first point is this. Look, where do we look? We look to the Christ. John chapter 6 and verse 12. Um, <clears throat> Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, sorry. is talking here about Jesus. And it says... It came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Do you know you're here today not because you decided it but because God called you. You're here because God called you. He called you to follow him. And this is the beautiful thing. Firstly, we look to the Christ. I look to the Christ and I'm reminded that I am called. And, and because I'm called by Christ, there are things that I no longer answer to any longer. You know, fear, lust, addiction, selfishness, anger. They no longer have a grip on me because I've been called by Christ. I look to Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, we preach Christ crucified. You know, Christ alone must be our focus and our guide. You know, if our, and, and again, I, I think it's important because if our aim is to be Christ-like, and it should be, that should be your aim, that should be your goal, then we must see him as he is and not as we want him to be. Amen? Uh, Luke chapter 19 and verse 11, we get here a vision of Christ and it says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat in him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword the way that he should rule the... the, the, uh, the and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This isn't the politically correct hemp bag carrying vegan Jesus who lets you do what you want and never judges. 
This is the warrior Jesus. This is the Jesus that, that has a tattoo on his, on his body saying, you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This, this is not some weak, anemic, you know, uh, base and male. This is Christ, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he's coming back to rule and reign. And, you know, ironically, it says that he judges and makes war. You know, a lot of people have a vision of Jesus. He's this kind of skinny, anemic, vegan kind of guy that just wouldn't offend anybody. But, you know, he comes back and people say, well, the God I serve doesn't judge. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Because the Bible I read says he judges and he makes war. And let me tell you something, God help anyone or anything that gets in his way. Jesus is returning for his church. And the Bible says his wife has made herself ready. How many of you want to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ? <laughs> Hallelujah. He judges and makes war. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. You see, when our eyes are on Christ and not on each other, we will make true progress in the Christian life. And this is why some of you haven't made any progress. Your eyes are on other people or else your eyes are on yourself. Because it's only that as we look to Jesus that we can glorify God. Because if we look at, at, at ourselves, we'll be discouraged. If, if we look at others, we will be distracted. But if we look at Christ, we will live. This is the commandment. Look and live. This is why we're to focus. Firstly, we look to the Christ. John chapter 6, 40. It's my Father's will that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. Do you know that even our eternal destiny hinges on whether or not we look to Christ? Amen. His promise is this, that he will raise us up at the last day. And if he has promised to raise us up on the last day, how much more will he raise us up on this day? Amen. He will raise you up from sickness, despair, depression or whatever else is going on in your life. If you look to him. That's why Micah 7 and 8 says, Rejoice not over me, my enemy, for though I fall, yet I will arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. We look to Jesus in every situation. Christ is our example and our guide. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Does that mean you having a, you know, a tattoo of Jesus on your arm or your chest or a picture of him on your wall or a statue of him on your mantelpiece? No, because you're not actually looking to Christ unless you're looking to his word. We read there in Revelation 19, his name is called the word of God. You do not know Jesus if you do not know his word. His word reveals him. His word reveals heaven. Glory to God. Amen. So this book has spoken to men and women down through the centuries in good times and in bad. And in every instance, this book has pointed men and women to Jesus. It has pointed to the Savior. It has pointed to him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. This is why we look to him. He is the way. Anything else is in the way. John 6 and verse 40 says, It's my Father's will that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Again, I think it's important. Even our eternal destiny hinges on whether we're looking to Him. Glory to God. Amen. So just like Micah 7 and 8, Rejoice not over me, my enemy. Though I, though I fall, yet I will arise. You need to take the attitude. You know what, Lord? Thank you that you're rising me up today in Jesus' name. Doesn't matter what's going on. He's rising you up. He's raising you up. You know, eight years ago, when my son Yoon was in children's church, um, they were coloring, and uh, the, the lady in the children's church said to Yoon, who was about five or six at the time, and um, there was a, a picture of, of Jesus, uh, you know, waist deep in water after being baptized, coming out of the water, a dove overhead, John the Baptist behind them, and she said, Yoon, who is that pointing at Jesus? And he said, I don't know. And she said, no, no, Yoon, he's just been baptized. Did you see the big dove over his head? That's John the Baptist. Who's that pointing at Jesus? And Ewan says, I don't know. And she said, it's, it's uh, Jesus. She's getting concerned. It's the pastor's son. Um, she said, it's, it's, uh, it's Jesus, Ewan. He said, no, it's not. And she said, uh, it's, it's Jesus. He says, no, it's not. And he says, Jesus doesn't sink. <sighs> and he had a point. 
If you cling to Jesus, if you look to Jesus, Jesus doesn't sink and you won't sink either. I don't know what's going on in your life or what's going wrong in your life, but if you cling to him, you won't sink. Glory to God. You're going to get through this. You're going to overcome this. You're going to conquer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look to Jesus. We look to the Christ. In every situation, Colossians 1.15 in the message says, we look at this son and see the God who cannot be seen. This is the beauty. We look to the son and see the God who cannot be seen. Matthew 22.29, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures are the power of God. Let me tell you this, an individual or a church that drifts from the Bible will invariably end up in deception and error. It's just a matter of time. And this is why we now have churches that openly deny the clear teachings of the scripture on, on, on gender, sexuality, marriage, the sanctity of life. You see, Christ is the light of the world. And the moment we turn from him, uh, invariably, we end up in darkness and depravity. And this is why you have famous, you know, um, Christian musicians and pastors uh, who refuse to call sin what it is because it might affect their popularity. All I can say is this, whatever they're looking to, they're certainly not looking to Christ. If you can't... You know, when you take the attitude, well, well, uh, who knows? The Bible is very clear, whether you realize it or not, on, on moral issues. It's very, very clear. And, and again, you accept it or re you reject it. You, you didn't write this book and you don't get to rewrite it. Amen? So if you're a follower of Christ, that means you're a follower of his word. And you accept his word, what it says, irrespective of how politically correct or uncomfortable that may be. It's truth. You accept it in Jesus' name. Amen? So again, the Bible says, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3, verse 6. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Hebrews 12. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. His word is the same. Amen? Again, let me re-emphasize. We are only following or looking to Christ to the degree that we are looking to his word. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2. Hallelujah. For these things my hand have made, and all these things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Who trembles at my word. When you tremble at God's word, you put what God thinks of you ahead of what people think of you. When you tremble at God's word, you will obey him in every situation and circumstance. You know, if we tremble at God's word, we will fearlessly obey it and proclaim it. I like the saying that says, he who kneels before God will stand before men. John 1, 14 says, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Does God's word settle it for you, even when it is inconvenient, uncomfortable, or even as in the case of the early Christian church, fatal? Do you know that by the year 325, over 2 million believers had given their lives for the gospel. They had been killed by gladiators, thrown to lions and other wild animals. They had been skinned alive. They had been crucified. They had endured, boiled. They had endured all sorts of terrible deaths. But they refused to back down because they trembled at God's word. And because they trembled at his word, they refused to tremble before secular magistrates and rulers. They were given the option, just make a small sacrifice to the emperor and you walk free. And yet in their millions, they refused to compromise their faith and went to their death. You know why? They were looking to the Christ. They were looking to the Christ. Who are you looking to today? What is your goal? What is your aim? What is your focus? Our focus must be Jesus. We must look to him alone. Proverbs 21, 16. The man who wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And you know, sadly, this describes many congregations. They may be wealthy. They may be large. They may be influential. But in God's eyes, they are dead. 
You might say that's pretty harsh, Pastor John. Well, Jesus said it, Revelation 3 and verse 1. You have a reputation that you are alive, but you are dead. I don't want to pastor a church like that. I prefer to pastor a church of 10 people that's living than a pastor a church of 10,000 that's dead. How we desperately need the fire of God from the altar of God to touch our lives. We need his power in our families, in our marriages, in our homes, in our nations. Because dead religion just will not do it. It will not meet the needs of this hour. Amen. Like Isaiah, I believe we need to touch that fire from the, from the altar of God. And when we do, it will change everything. We will see breakthrough, but it won't be because of clever ideas of man or agendas or formulas or, you know, you know, aligning yourself with the latest church franchise or the latest, you know, flavor of the month. But rather because we, we connect with, with heaven, we connect, we get a vision of Christ our Lord. You see, the world will only get a vision of Christ when we get a vision of him. Amen. I think this is so important. Thank you, Jesus. John 12, 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from this earth, will draw all men to myself. That's our job is lift up Jesus. I was out in the street on Friday night and I was just struck by, you know, when I was preaching, how many Irish people walk by and look at you with a mixture of, 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 of pity and uh, anger. Surprise, shock, dismay. They think I'm crazy. And they're heading towards a, a Christless eternity. If I be lifted up from this earth, I will draw all men unto me. We have one job and that is to boldly lift up Christ without reserve and without apology. I think it's important, amen. We must lift up Christ and not ourselves. And you will not do that if you are not looking to him. You know, Acts chapter 8 and verse 5 talks about Philip the evangelist. Um, you know, he went to the city of Samaria. Acts chapter 8. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. You know why we're not seeing miracles in the modern church? Because in so many instances, we boil church down to some sort of a lifeless, dead franchise. Get them in and out in an hour. Give a nice, Christless TED talk that won't offend or make anybody uncomfortable. We're not looking to Jesus. We're looking to natural things to cause the church to grow. Because let me tell you something. There's many pastors who have made a God out of church growth. That is their obsession. That's all they want is the church to grow. Our call is to be obedient. That is our first call. Like I've said before, if the whole lot of you walk out because you don't like this message, deal with it. That's between you and God. I want to be faithful to him. It says he preached Christ to them. He preached Christ to them. When I look at the church landscape and I see so many pastors who refuse to say anything controversial. Who refuse to address the, the, the moral decay that we see in our society. I ask myself, who or what are they serving? How can they remain silent? We're killing our babies. We're trotting God's word underfoot and treating it like it's irrelevant. Where are the men and women who have the burden of the Lord? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. We must come back to the place where we look at Jesus, where our message is Jesus, our focus is Jesus, our life is Jesus, where we are following Jesus. Come what may, come what may, we follow him. Philip was a man with just one message. He lifted up Christ and he shook his generation. Maybe this is the reason why the church is largely ignored in our society because we have ceased to look to Christ. 
Let me read the words of a man who once shook this nation. A man who turned this whole nation back to God. Patrick, may Christ shield me today. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit, Christ when I stand, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Is it any wonder that Patrick shook Ireland with the power of the gospel because he was single in his focus? He was looking to Christ alone. Firstly, we look to the cross. Secondly, we look to the cross. I look to the cross and I'm reminded that I'm loved. I look to the cross and I'm reminded I'm called. I look to the cross and I'm reminded that I'm loved because the cross is an everlasting testament to God's undying, unconditional love for you and for me. The cross is proof of the immense value that God places on your eternal soul. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Do you know that the cross is proof that you are loved? The cross is proof that you matter. The cross is proof that God was willing to pay a price to purchase your soul in blood. We look to the cross. This is why Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too the Son of Man must be lifted up. Do you know that this story in Numbers was a mystery for over 1,400 years? It made no sense to anybody until that time when Christ hung on that cross in our place. It didn't make sense until Christ placed his feet on Calvary's hill and was nailed to that rugged cross. It was only then that the Old Testament type and shadow was fulfilled. Because the Bible says the kingdom of God didn't understand the cross. And sadly, I think the church doesn't appreciate the cross. 1 Corinthians 2.8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> but in the same way as the serpent became a source of, of, of healing and deliverance by being placed on a pole, so too the cross became a symbol of hope, healing, and new life for all of us. Because the Bible says that Calvary was called the place of the skull. Calvary was a place that was so synonymous with death and suffering that it was called the place of the skull. And yet by God's grace, ironically, the place of death became a place of life. A symbol of death and suffering became a, a symbol of hope and healing. This is what God does. And this is why, you know, in the same way as, as we see in Genesis 2 and verse 3, in, in Genesis 12 and verse 9, the serpent is used as a symbol of, of sin and evil. So too Christ became what we were, which is sin. That we could be loosed from what once bound us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him to be sin for us. It didn't say he, he, he took upon himself, it says he became God made him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How many of you can say today, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I mightn't feel like it. I mightn't look like it. But you know what? I believe your word. I've called on the name of Jesus and I'm righteous in God's sight. Heaven is my home. Jesus is my Lord. I have nothing to fear in this life or the next. Could somebody say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. We look to the cross. The living Bible says, for God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. You see, it was a bronze serpent. Bronze speaks of judgment because bronze was, was created by putting it through the fires of judgment. And again, a, a serpent was symbolic of sin. And so when they looked at a serpent on a pole, it was symbolic of sin that had been judged. You see, some of you still struggle with your past. Some of you might even be struggling with your present. But let me remind you something. Your judgment was taken by Jesus. You don't have to fear judgment. Jesus was judged for you. And that's why the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Could somebody say, thank you, Jesus. I am free because of the cross. Hallelujah. 
We all have things we're ashamed of. We all have things we're embarrassed of. But we need to look to the cross and not to our sin, our inadequacy, or our past. We look to the cross and we're reminded that we are free. Thank you, Jesus. Hell has lost its hold on you. Thank you, Jesus. Christ bore our judgment on the cross. He suffered our punishment and our pain. This is why we don't have to fear death because Jesus drank that bitter cup for you and me. And just like I said, it says they only had to look. There is no mention. They only had to look at the, at the serpent on the pole and they were healed. It doesn't mention worthiness or virtue or effort. It just says they had to look and live. And this is a symbol of God's grace. There is nothing you can do to be saved. The Bible says, by grace, you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, the serpent on a pole is a symbol of God's everlasting grace. There is nothing you could do to earn God's love or to merit it. And yet he freely gave it through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.9, we see Jesus who's made Lord and the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that the grace of, by, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is why Isaiah 45 says, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. You know what God is saying through that verse? Look and live. Look and live. Because not only do we find forgiveness at the cross, we find healing. Amen. We find healing. Isaiah 53. Surely he had borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. Healing is yours today. It was purchased 2,000 years ago. God doesn't want you to be sick. He wants you well. Glory to God. Can that be a good place to shout amen? Amen. I don't know about you. I don't like being sick. Thank God that healing is ours. It was purchased at the cross. Healing is ours. We only need look and live. Look at the cross. Look at what he did there and you will live. Take your eyes off of your symptoms and put them on his cross because Christ purchased your healing in blood. Just look and live. Just look and be healed today. You know, it's interesting that our government, many of whom are sold out followers of Satan, I believe. Now, don't say that lightly, but I believe that. Any of you that have ever heard, held a newborn baby in your arms, understand there has to be something seriously wrong with you to justify taking that baby apart piece by piece in the name of convenience or woman's health or any of the other euphemisms they use for taking the life of an innocent baby. But it's interesting that many of our governments have now called out to the hospitals that they need to remove the crucifix from the walls in case those who hold to pagan religions or those who are atheists are offended by the presence of the cross. Let me tell you something. The only reason why hospitals are there in the first place was because men and women were moved by the compassion of Christ to reach out to the hurting, the sick, and the needy. Study history. You'll see that. It wasn't atheists were working with those who had smallpox and all sorts of other infectious diseases. It was men and women who were motivated by the love of Christ. Many instances, priests and nuns, very same ones being demonized in the media. You know, not all of them were bad. Many of them were good people. But you know, there's this, this move right now to remove all acknowledgement of God in our society. And so many times the pulpits are silent. We don't look like we're not with the times. We don't want to look like we're uh, uh, bigoted or that we actually believe something. Jesus said in Matthew 25, nearly finished my message, but Matthew 25. And the king will answer, said, I sure dare say to you, in so much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's what motivated Mother Teresa to go to hell hole. That was Calcutta and minister to the dying, minister to the lepers, minister to the broken, 
Minister to the, to the rejected, the disenfranchised, those who are considered completely without value. This is what moved men and women down through the ages. They looked to the Christ and they looked to the cross. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. You see, the gospel message calls us to follow Christ. It calls us to repentance. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 1. God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And just the very reason why these same, you know, educated, accomplished, you know, powerful people want to remove the cross is simply evidence of the fact that they are perishing. That they do not see things spiritually. They do not know the truth. They're not walking in the light. But as the church, we must make a quality decision that we are going to walk in the light even if nobody else does. It says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We look to Christ. We look to the cross. You see, this is the problem. In many instances, we look to our own virtue, our own works. We look to the, the you know, this preacher, or this prophet. When this person comes to town, I'll get my breakthrough. No, you can just come straight to Christ and he'll meet you where you are. Amen. We need to stop that. Stop putting people on a pedestal. God will meet you where you are. He'll meet you right there in your seat today. If you will trust him, if you will reach out to him in faith. Jesus did enough. Do you believe that he purchased your healing at the cross? He's going to heal people today. I believe that because he did it 2,000 years ago. Galatians 2 verse 20. Just give me five minutes and I'm finished. Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, when we come to the cross... We're going to be changed. You can come to church and walk out the exact same way as you walk in. Fact is, there's people all around the world go to church and it does nothing to change how they live. But you cannot come to Christ. You cannot come to the cross and walk away unchanged. There is power in the cross. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. When he died, I died. I don't live for myself anymore. I live for him. I live for his purposes. So many believers never even take a moment to ask God, are you in this? Do you want me to do this or not, Lord? We live our lives as if God didn't exist. But Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I live. But Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the cross does this. The cross crucifies our pride and our selfishness. The cross makes us dead to sin, to pride, and to temptation. The cross confronts our pride and humbles us before God because you can't stay close to the cross and, and be proud or arrogant. You look at the cross and you're reminded that you are nothing. You're reminded that your suffering is nothing. You're reminded that whether or not you're embarrassed or whether or not you're defriended or whether or not you're persecuted or whether or not they take your life is irrelevant because he did it already for you. The cross confronts us. All of our agendas, our pride, our vanity, our, our, our plans, our conceit die at the foot of the cross. This is why as a church we have to regularly come to the cross. That's why I have it up here on the stage. I want to remind you there was a price for your salvation. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. You know what he was saying? Quit playing games. Quit playing religious games. Either serve him or don't. But don't be lukewarm. I wish you were hot or cold. And this is why Satan wants to obscure the cross. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often. And now tell you even weeping that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. Do you know that Paul was writing to the Philippians? This was written to Christians. I find it very sobering that I can preach a great message. 
I can look good, I can sound good, but I can be an enemy of the cross. You can come to church, have a Bible under your arm, and be an enemy of the cross. Paul said, many are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who've set their mind on earthly things. Where's your mindset? Where's your focus? What are you looking at? Who are you looking at? Who are you following? We must look to the Christ. We must look to the cross. Because if we insist on being friends of the world, we're enemies of the cross. Because the cross calls us to repentance. The cross calls us to surrender. The cross calls us to die. You know the number one reason why people come to church is because somebody invites them. What's the number one reason why we don't invite people to church? Because we're afraid of what people will think. We've got to get over that fear. God wants to give you a new boldness. He wants to give you a compassion for souls. We look to the Christ. We look to the cross. Lastly, we look to the commission. Give me two minutes, I'm finished. I look to the Christ and I'm reminded that I'm called. I look to the cross and I'm reminded that I'm loved. I look to the commission and I'm reminded that I'm needed. How many of you know you are needed? You are needed. God needs you. He wants to work through you. He wants to reach other people through you. You know, Isaiah, uh, Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Isaiah chapter uh, 6 said, here I am, send me. You see, when, uh, when Isaiah was confronted with the glory of God, the very first response uh, w w after he was cleansed, after he was delivered, after God's fire touched him, was he had a new burden for his generation. And he said, here am I, send me. He, behold, he beheld God's glory could never be the, the same again. He wanted to take that message of life. You know, Acts chapter 5 verse 20 says, Go into the temple and give the people this message of life. The NIV says, Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. That's our job. We're called to go tell people about this new life. You might be able to preach like I said. You might be able to give a three-point sermon. But you know what? You can tell somebody your story. You can tell somebody what the Lord Jesus has done for you. Can anybody here today say the Lord has done something for me? He's done something in me. He's doing something in me in Jesus' name. Amen? We, we, the commission. We look to the commission. And we realize that we are needed. You see, Christ gave us the great commission, not the great suggestion. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who doesn't believe shall be condemned. Do you believe that? Do you believe that it's about heaven or hell? Do you believe that this life ultimately terminates in heaven or hell? Because that's what the Bible says. And it doesn't matter how cultured, how nice, how kind. If they know Jesus, they'll go to heaven. If they don't, they'll go to hell. That's what the Bible says. We have to ask ourselves, do we believe that? Because this is our calling. You know, the truth is this. If the Great Commission applies to us today, and I believe it does, then our plans are too small and not too big. If God is your partner, then make your plans big, D.L. Moody. Hudson Taylor said this, the great commission is not an option to be considered, it's a command to be obeyed as the worship group come forward. So what are you doing to see that Christ's commission is being fulfilled? Can I be honest as a pastor, I'm so tired of dealing with Christians who get their nose out of joint and get offended. It's time to grow up people. I'm tired of, 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 I'm tired of it. Because the, you know what? The need is so great. We've been given a great commission. And yet people come to church and act like babies. Get over yourself. If you're offended, let me tell you something. If you're offended, it's because your eyes are on yourself. Not on him. That's good preaching, Pastor John. We look to the Christ. We look to the cross. We look to the commission. If you're looking to the commission, you're going to be too busy to be offended. You're just going to forgive him and move on in Jesus' name. Amen? Let me read this by Brother Andrew. Of course it's dangerous, but it's a lot more dangerous for all of us if we don't do it.
Even in a conquering army, there are casualties. Safety is not the issue when we look at the Great Commission. The purpose of the church cannot be to survive or even to thrive, but to serve. We're called to serve our generation. We're called to reach our generation with the gospel of God's grace. But we're to be motivated by love and not by fear or by, by, by obligation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, for the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ urges us. The, the Amplified says the love of Christ urges and impels us. We must be motivated by love. This message is not about putting you under obligation. We're to be compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. You see, just like the early Christian church, we have a calling to take the light out into dark places. We must not limit what God can do in our time. Because just as they looked and lived, so must we. And so will others if we go tell them. If we go tell them, they will look and live because we are surrounded right now by a generation that have been bitten by the serpent. And they are dying. And we have a job to go tell them, look and live. There is a solution. There is an answer. You don't need that, those drugs. You don't need that porn. You don't need that alcohol. You don't need that, that materialism. You don't need that immorality. You need Jesus. You need to look and live. You need to look and live. You need to look and live in Jesus' name. Mark 1. It says, Simon and the others went out to find him and they said, everyone was looking at you. But Jesus said, we must go on to the other towns as well. And I will preach to them. This is why I came. This is why I came. We must press forward in spite of opposition. We must look to the Christ. We must look to the cross. We must look to the commission. We must not turn to the left or to the right. We must make a decision that we will move forward in Jesus' name and that we will see our generation come to know the love of the Father. And so if you could stand to your feet today in Jesus' name, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know the Lord wants to do miracles in this place. So if you're sick in your body, I just want you right now, lift your hands to the Lord. The Lord is going to manifest His healing power in this place. I don't know what that sickness or disease is, but I want you to take your eyes off me and I want you to put your eyes on the Lord. He's here in this place. His presence is here. And He is here to break chains. He is here to lift burdens. He is here to set the captives free. Jesus purchased your healing on the cross and today he wants to manifest that in your body so right now in the name of Jesus Christ Lord you see every person don't switch off please I encourage you stay engaged stay open right now the Lord is going to do a miracle if you're in a position to receive so take your eyes off me lift your hands to the Lord and in the name of Jesus Christ you know every person you know every situation you know every circumstance Lord Father there are people here today that have broken hearts there are people today that have lost loved ones. There are people today that are struggling with sickness or disease or living with depression or despair. There's people here with problems for which they have no solution. But we know the answer is look and live. We're going to look and live today, Lord. We're going to look and live. We're taking our eyes off our situation and we're putting our eyes on you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke every sickness.